Currently, I'm at, um, I'm at the University of Glasgow. So last, I've been there since, uh, since last summer. Um, last year, um, I'll just go back one there. Uh, last year, um, this new imaging centre was opened there. So this is built around um, a new seven Tesla scanner, uh, which, is, which has been put on site at um, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, for those of you that know, know Glasgow, this is the, the site of the old Southern General Hospital, uh, just south of the Clyde. Um, and it's a, a strong collaboration uh, with the, between the NHS and, and the university, uh, the main campus being just, just across the river in the west end of Glasgow. Um, I have uh, a couple of disclosures to mention. Um, during my time, uh, both at Siemens and at the Fraunhofer Society in Germany, I've registered a number of patents in the area of MRI, um, some, some topics of which are covered uh, in this presentation. Um, at the University of Glasgow, uh, we're grateful to have a research agreement from Siemens, uh, so they're, they're supporting our research, but uh, uh, there's no direct financial contribution uh, involved at this stage. So, um, I've selected some of my favourite frontiers in MRI. Um, I think when I first started MRI at the end of the 80s, I felt um, a regret that I hadn't started 10 years earlier, because it seemed like, obviously, uh, Professor Mallard and, um, and, and obviously uh, the stuff that was going on in, in Nottingham and Aberdeen together at the time. Uh, I, I think I thought I'd missed the boat, but actually, um, since starting in the, in the late 80s, it seems like there's been one new, fantastic, interesting opportunity after another. Um, and so uh, it's the, the excitement, I feel, in the field has continued. So um, the, the topics I've selected, uh, which um, I'd like to cover today. Um, firstly, um, high-quality diffusion MRI, which is um, currently having a big impact on uh, clin in clinical practice. Uh, scan acceleration, so the ability to use uh, the so-called SMS method, uh, so acquiring data simultaneously from multiple slices, allowing us to dramatically increase uh, the speed of uh, data acquisition. Um, another approach to, the data, the, uh, to um, improving scan times is, of course, compressed sensing. And so this is, uh, many of you will be familiar with this in, in different fields, uh, but this is certainly having a, a major impact in MRI. Uh, where we uh, subsample the data and then uh, use iterative reconstruction to um, reconstruct the data. Um, Image-based motion correction. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the equipment that we have today has a great real-time capability. So during the scanner, we can apply some monitoring uh, and try to correct for subject motion. Uh, this is uh, clearly a, a, a big issue if you go to any uh, clinical site right now. Um, and you'll, you'll notice, of course, a, a number of artifacts uh, due to subject motion. Uh, final topic, um, seven Tesla MRI. So this is my current field of research. Um, so we've, we've now moved into a domain where um, seven Tesla imaging is now being applied clinically. Um, and so in my particular area, we're doing some clinical studies trying to understand uh, where those benefits might lie uh, for uh, diagnostic radiology. Uh, so I thought uh, just to start with, um, I'd, have, I'd have a little quick summary of uh, diffusion MRI, um, just to put some of, some of the work into context. And so you will be familiar with um, the idea of uh, free diffusion and having a, a Gaussian model uh, to describe uh, the displacement of, of uh, particles uh, in this context. Obviously, as, as we move into uh, biological tissue, uh, things, of course, are very much more complicated. Um, so we try to acknowledge this by just introducing the concept, concept of uh, an apparent diffusion coefficient. So we kind of assume that it's still free, but we know really that it's actually not free. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, I'm not going to cover it today, but there's actually a lot of interesting developments in um, uh, processing the data in a different way to uncover the microstructure in, in a different way. So when we're performing these uh, diffusion studies, um, we apply um, a, a dephasing gradient and a rephasing gradient, and uh, anything that moves in between the two, uh, we have a signal attenuation, and this is the, the, the fairly sort of simple mechanism by which we are able to, uh, we are able to um, follow the diffusion behavior in the tissue. Uh, we can quantify it in terms of a B value, which uh, expresses the, uh, the strength of our diffusion weighting, um, and uh, you can see here, if we have an unweighted scan uh, with B equals zero, then this is essentially is a T2-weighted scan. If we have uh, a scan with a, a typical clinical B value of 1,000, you can see clearly that uh, the fluid signal has been attenuated, 
um, and we, we're still seeing a uh, signal from the, the grey and the white tissue. Uh, we can quantify this process uh, by making this uh, rather over oversimplified assumption of exponential decay, um, and we can produce um, these quantitative maps. Clinically, they're, they're very useful because they, they, only give, they give us information specifically about diffusion and uh, take away some of the other information, uh, such as T2 relax relaxation times. Um, so, uh, where, does this, where is this useful? Um, so, in, an early, in the early 90s, uh, the work by Warak, Warak and colleagues introduced uh, this, this um, observation that essentially, when you have uh, cytotoxic edema, cell swelling, uh, you, have this, uh, you have this reduced diffusion, and in the very, in the very acute stages of stroke, you see uh, these very clear signal enhancements. Um, and then just to show here, if you go up in uh, B value, in this case up to 4,000, uh, you can see how, obviously how the contrast changes. And we still have signal from uh, the lesion, uh, but signal from the rest of the brain tissue at this stage has, has more or less uh, disappeared. Um, it's interesting to look at the evolution of the signal. And so you'll see here this example um, of a, a, a child with a basal ganglia lesion. And you can see um, at a two-day and a six-day time point um, how the ADC is evolving. And so uh, this, this is information which uh, allows us to chart the course of the disease and some of the underlying mechanisms of stroke. Uh, particularly interesting if uh, there are multiple lesions, uh, so it's easy to identify if maybe there's, there's a, a new lesion which uh, has happened uh, subsequent to, to the original uh, insult. Um, and of course, the other thing we can do with diffusion is we can exploit this, this property of anisotropy, um, and we can... Uh, acquire what's typically done clinically is we acquire three images with the diffusion gradient supplied perpendicularly, and then we take advantage of the fact that um, the trace-weighted image, so, so this is the geometric mean of these three images, gives us uh, an image where we've taken away the anisotropy, so we can just see the signal of the, uh, the abnormalities. So this is the standard clinical scan. And then, of course, um, if we want to exploit the anisotropy, we can use a diffusion tensor uh, to look at uh, the direction of uh, principal diffusivity, and then we can produce these, these nice colorful diagrams of, uh, of fiber tracks in the brain. So now moving on to uh, the, the newly evolving methods. Um, so as many of you who are working with diffusion will know, uh, this method obviously inherently is uh, sensitive to motion. So if we apply uh, the diffusion sensitizing gradients to a standard sequence type, we get this kind of image here, which is clearly unusable uh, because it's uh, heavily um, artifacted because of this motion uh, during the diffusion preparation. Uh, so the, the standard solution to this has been for a couple of decades, more or less, uh, to use um, a, a, single, a single shot method uh, such as echoplanar imaging. Um, and you can see this does the job very well of giving us nice, clear images. Uh, but, of course, uh, there's a penalty to pay. Uh, these images have low resolution. Um, they're very sensitive to distortion. So you, you'll see um, in areas where there's uh, large susceptibility gradients, we have these uh, signal enhancements and distortions, uh, particularly as you go down to the lower, lower levels in the brain. So lesions in the brainstem and um, in the inferior slices uh, in the temporal lobes uh, that can be easily missed. And uh, because of the low resolution and blurring, uh, we haven't got the, uh, the fine detail to, to look at small abnormalities. So what can we do about that? Um, so for many years, uh, there's been a number of approaches uh, using multi-shot imaging uh, to try to address this problem. And, and essentially, the, the trick here is to apply some kind of phase correction to um, avoid the artifacts that, that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, so one method um, is uh, readout segmented echoplanar imaging. So um, for those of you familiar with these diagrams, or those of you maybe not familiar with these diagrams, I'll just point out we've got the diffusion, um, the diffusion encoding gradients here that I showed on a previous slide. And then um, we have a number of the, the, the waveforms that are used for spatial encoding from the three different gradient axes, and obviously some data sampling. Uh, so the key thing with these, uh, these techniques is this uh, rapidly oscillating readout gradient, which is the one that makes uh, all the noise that everyone is usually discussing when they uh, are volunteers for these uh, particular studies. And the key thing that I want to point out about this particular type of acquisition is so we, we now acquire the data in multiple shots, and so each one of these is a, a single shot. And instead of um, acquiring data across the whole of case space, which is the, 
the raw data acquisition space. We now acquire just from one segment, and the interesting point to note here is that um, the data points are all um, next to each other, so we have a Nyquist sample data set, which is important for the uh, possibilities of correction. Um, and in terms of data, in terms of image quality, by having a very short echo spacing between these different, read, these different uh, gradients here, um, down to 340 milliseconds, we're able to get rid of a lot of the artifacts and the blurring that you, that you see in the single shot images. So, how can we uh, apply these corrections? So, the, the, key, the key step here is to introduce, um, introduce a new um, navigator echo into the acquisition. Uh, so, so this is something that's been around for some time since the mid-90s. Uh, Roger Aldridge and others have, have investigated this. Uh, so this has matured now to the point uh, where we try to acquire um, a 2D navigator. So this is also an image. And what we're able to do at this point, uh, you'll see here um, the navigator data, which allow us at each um, acquisition point to plot this phase variation. So this phase variation is uh, motion-induced, and this is the thing that uh, is preventing us normally from doing these multi-shot studies. Um, and then if you look at the image data, um, with respect to my previous comment about Nyquist sampling, uh, each of those individual shots um, has got different spatial frequency components, but it's Nyquist sampled. So we can then, uh, in a very trivial way, we can simply perform uh, a complex conjugate con uh, co um, multiplication, and we can, at each of these data points, we can get rid of this phase variation. And this allows us then uh, to acquire some nice high-resolution diffusion-weighted images, which are more similar to the standard clinical images that we're familiar with uh, for other contrasts. And then just one last point. Uh, it turns out that's actually not quite enough to give us the, the robust behavior um, and reduce the sensitivity to motion. And so another thing we can do is we can exploit some of the real-time capabilities of the, scan, of the scanners that are available today. Um, and the navigate, we can look at the navigator during the scan, and on occasions you have a, a, a sort of anom anomaly where you have a very extreme phase variation and you actually get some signal loss. And you can see here um, in this navigator image, hopefully, uh, some regions of signal loss, and these data are then really not available for correcting. Um, and then we can identify these during the scan and then reacquire. So you'll see here um, on, the top, on the top you have... Um, the, the image that uh, has been compiled from the corrupt data, and then the image that's been acquired, uh, so this is also just during the scan, reacquiring the data that are corrupt, and then we've, we've got rid of this, uh, this artifact here. So having done all that, um, we're left with um, a, data, a data set which gives us, uh, which, so if you're looking on the left, you have the single shot data set, and on the right, we have the multi shot data set. And hopefully you can clearly see the improvement, uh, in the re reduction in blurring, and the reduction in some of these susceptibility artifacts. They're not entirely, they haven't entirely disappeared, but they're mo very much reduced. Uh, and so th this, this kind of technique has found its way now into a wide range of applications in neuroscience uh, and clinical, um, clinical radiology. Um, so here's a couple of examples uh, showing you uh, sort of high resolution studies in the brain. Uh, so firstly on the left side here, so sort of fractional anisotropy. Uh, so this is uh, just plotting, uh, plotting the, um, the regions of the brain uh, which have got a, a large amount of diffusion anisotropy um, showing uh, with a high signal. And you can see the single shot images at the top, but the multi shot images at the bottom. And uh, you can clearly see that we're able to push the resolution uh, to a much higher level. And then some clinical data shown on the right. Um, so the same subject um, uh, here, here we're showing with the single shot data at the top. Uh, the multi-shot data at the bottom. And uh, you can see now that uh, it's, it's possible to reduce the blurring and identify some of these smaller lesions and characterize the disease uh, in, a, in a much more extensive way. Um, quite an, an interesting opportunity with these new sequences is that we're able to start looking at diffusion in other body areas, which was previously rather tricky. Um, for example, the, looking in the, in, the, in the C spine, where there's um, lots of, typically lots of, uh, field variation due to, due to the, the curvature of the spine and, and, the, and the anatomical structures. Uh, it's usually very difficult to, to shim this region to reduce the, the field variation. So single shot imaging performs very badly in this area and uh, it, it really uh, was not um, a viable clinical tool up to this point b before these sequences. And you can see here now, uh, looking on the left, it's possible to do these diffusion-weighted imaging studies of the brain and to include um, an, a nice example of uh, signal going down uh, the, sp the spinal cord. Um, similarly, here, a color-coded anisotropy map showing you the direction of diffusion at each level. 
um, and then obviously then th this can be uh, processed into into these uh, delightful uh, color coded uh, rendered uh, presentations um, and then extending this now uh, look trying to look at whole spine imaging on the right and uh, acquiring data at each different level and combining the data together to produce the, these large images. Uh, previously, this was also quite tricky, uh, where we had lots of distortions in the single shot case. Uh, a nice clinical example here uh, in uh, a child uh, where they're looking at drop metastases to, to the spine. Um, and you can see here, firstly, a T1 weighted, post-contrast T1 weighted image and uh, the axial version of the same, the same data set. And you can see there's a lesion here, but it's really not very clear. Um, and then by applying then a diffusion-weighted scan, uh, there's really a, a really clear uh, lesion uh, actually uh, uh, on the spinal cord here. So this, making this contrast available to um, diffusion weight, uh, making this contrast available to these pediatric tumor studies uh, has really got an, an immediate clinical benefit. Um, another spine application, um, in this case, uh, there's, um, the technique can be used to, for, uh, to provide a differential diagnosis between a benign or a, a metastatic vertebral uh, compression fracture. And uh, in this case, they're exploiting the quantitative data available from the ADC. So we can see here a, a low level in the case of this metastat metastatic tumor infiltration and a much higher value in the case of a, a benign fracture. Um, breast tumors, this is, this is also an, an er interesting area of study uh, for, um, with diffusion-weighted imaging. Uh, firstly, uh, just a quote from an earlier paper where they were able to uh, identify a clear benefit for this, te this technique at three tesla. And then I've introduced some seven tesla images here, and you can see that uh, we're able to, uh, obviously going up to seven tesla with the increased uh, available signal, and also with these multi-shot methods, we're able now to image uh, image the tumor in the breast uh, with diffusion-weighted imaging uh, with a high uh, spatial resolution of down, down to below one millimeter. Uh, and a nice, a nice example here, um, because we have less distortions, uh, there's an impact on radiotherapy planning. Uh, so in this case, you can see uh, two, uh, two cases where um, drawing the lesion around uh, the single-shot image or, um, or the uh, multi-shot image, uh, you can see some quite different behavior here. So um, this is, uh, this is obviously uh, giving a different extent of, of the lesion. Um, and similarly, there's the same case at the bottom where in the case of the original single shot method, it looks like the lesion is extending outside of the prostate, um, but in the rather more reliable multi-shot method, uh, we, we see that it's uh, contained uh, more within the, the gland. Um, uh, similarly here, this is an interesting comparison with, um, with PET. So if you take these diffusion weighted images and you uh, you take the negative contrast and also you apply some fat suppression, you can get these sort of PET-like uh, contrasts, which I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, and again, the, this is some previously with single-shot methods not necessarily easy to do in all body regions. The neck uh, has uh, quite a lot of uh, distortion and so forth. And so this is an example of applying these multi-shot methods uh, to, to show these, these lesions very clearly. Uh, Moving up to um, some seven, seven tesla data. Um, now, as we move up to seven tesla, the, the T2 star reduces, which means we have more blurring, and we also have increased susceptibility artifacts. So the challenge of acquiring data with single shot imaging uh, becomes uh, more extreme. And uh, if you look at the top right, uh, there's a nice kind of comparison here where we have this rather blurred image um, of, of a single shot acquisition, and then a multi shot acquisition is given us uh, very clear, uh, detailed uh, anatomy. And then at the bottom here, uh, moving, up, moving down to a very high resolution of, of 0.7 uh, in plane. And uh, another interesting outcome of, of this uh, preliminary work was that we were able to visualize the, um, the radial anisotropy in the cortex. So uh, everyone's familiar with the, the anisotropy in white matter, but there's also anisotropy in the cortex. And if we, get, if we get to the right level of spatial resolution, then you can see this nice and clearly. Uh, uh, that you can see the, the direction of the diffusion uh, that's going through the cortex. Um, moving on to my next topic, uh, so this is simultaneous multi-slice imaging. Uh, so th this technique exploits um, the multi-channel multi capability of the scanners that we use today. Um, so um, I, I'm sure that uh, working with different scanners, you'll probably have a range of um, elements, but going in anything from eight up to sort of 64 receive elements. This, this gives us a, another dimension of, of spatial encoding. 
And so what we're able to do now is um, we're able to um, simultaneously acquire, acquire uh, simultaneously excite two slices, um, and then simultaneously acquire the data from these two slices. And in this case, we essentially have aliasing, so we have the signal from two regions which are now collapsed onto each other. Um, but we can exploit uh, the spatial variation of the sensitivity of the coils to, to try to uh, um, separate the signals out and then allocate them to the appropriate slice. So firstly, uh, th there will be an element which is, uh, has a great sensitivity to the lower slice, and uh, conversely, uh, other elements will have a higher sensitivity to, to other slices. So there's a number of methods which have been developed uh, to uh, exploit th this property. And this allows us to essentially then acquire uh, multiple slices in one go. Uh, the method has been around for some time, but uh, it's only in recent times that uh, some sort of uh, last minute tweaks, if you like, have been made available that, that have, have uh, really created an impact for this methodology uh, in, in clinical work and, and in research. Uh, so in particular, um, it's now possible to use this technique uh, in conjunction with echoplanar imaging. Um, and that also applies to some of these multi-shot methods. So the disadvantage of the multi-shot methods that I introduced earlier in the presentation is, of course, that they take a little bit longer. Sometimes they take quite a bit longer. Uh, so anything that uh, can uh, reduce this acquisition time uh, becomes important. So these images here at the bottom uh, from uh, collaborators in Oxford. Uh, so this is showing here, um, on the left here, the uh, multi-shot multi version, and then on the right, the single-shot version and similarly for, for the second patient. And so uh, these, these scans can now uh, acquire data from the whole brain with diffusion weighting in uh, something like a three to four minute scan time. So this is now a, very, a clinically very uh, realistic type of examination. Um, giving, just to give some insight into uh, what we can achieve with these, uh, these methods. Um, so here we have, uh, this is a healthy subject, um, diffusion weighted imaging uh, of the breast. And you can see here that um, this is the standard sequence. And if we apply then the accelerated sequence, we, uh, the nice thing about this particular methodology is that it has a very low penalty in SNR. So we don't lose very much signal to noise. We just have the ability to acquire very much quicker. Um, so the, uh, here is uh, this case here, which is um, simply the same protocol with the, the simultaneous multi-slice option. And we've come down from five minutes to sort of two and a half, from five and a half minutes to two and a half minutes. Alternatively, it might be interesting to uh, use the same scan time and just acquire a larger number of thinner slices. And so this obviously allows us then to look at the anatomy in, in greater detail uh, with these thinner slices, in this case of three and a half millimeters instead of five millimeters. Oops. Built some water over here. I think that's okay, is it? Um, next slide. Oops, a bit too slow. Oh, right, I was there. Let's try and see what happens. So I don't know if I've flooded some electronics here. Maybe not. Uh, sorry. Um, now, the, of course, you're probably familiar, those of you working with uh, tractography experiments and diffusion, uh, you'll be aware that these things take forever. And um, so uh, having these SMS methods available uh, has a really, a great, a really big impact. Um, and again, it allows us to apply these multi-shot methods, which would otherwise be prohib prohibitively long. And so here's an, a nice example uh, where we're able to, using the multi-shot method um, at, the top, at the top row, um, we're able to uh, see some structures here, for example, the visualization of the anterior commissure. You can see, you can see this structure very clearly in the multi-shot scan, uh, which has got a very sharp point spread function. Um, and in the lower, lower single-shot scan, uh, th these features are really not, not evident. Um, and then, uh, again, back to the point of uh, being able to image the spine, um, it's quite nice to do these combined studies where we're, uh, we're plotting the tractography in the brain, um, and simultaneously we're, look, we're um, following the tracks uh, down into the spinal cord. So, so this, this is a nice a new intriguing possibility with, with these sequence types. Uh, something else we've been looking at uh, to exploit this um, multi-slice acquisition method um, in this case, what we're trying to do is acquire um, multiple contrasts uh, in one single acquisition. 
Uh, so the studies I've shown you before of SMS are requiring, were requiring one contrast type from multiple slices. And so the, the, two, the data sets are required at the same time and then separated uh, with, during data processing. Um, and then uh, we're able to uh, now do the same trick, but we acquire multiple contrasts from the different slices. So we have here um, a T2 weighted scan and a T2 star weighted scan, from, uh, respectively, from different slices. And then we can perform the same trick and extract the, the original different contrasts from the data set. Uh, why, why might we want to do this? Um, so one of, the limit, one of the situations with the simultaneous multi-slice method is that you, the reason it becomes quicker is because we reduce the TR time. Uh, but at some point, reducing that repetition time uh, is, is no longer possible because we would have an effect on the contrast or we would lose some signal to noise. Uh, so we might be able to instead uh, exploit uh, this uh, simultaneous multi-contrast method um, and uh, reduce the overall examination time by acquiring multiple contrasts. And so th these two images were required, these two image types were required separately, but just to indicate uh, where the clinical potential is. Uh, so if we were able to acquire diffusion-weighted imaging and T2-star weighted imaging uh, at the same time, uh, then obviously the T2-star weighted imaging is in interesting for looking at hemorrhage and the diffusion obviously for looking at the ischemic stroke. Um, so uh, what we do to achieve this is um, we have... Uh, radio frequency pulses which are operating as on the different slices. So um, we have here the blue, the blue slices, are, the blue pulses are applying uh, to one slice position and then the, the red pulse is, uh, X is, is operating at a different slice position. And we end up then with uh, data which are simultaneously uh, available for acquisition. Um, and then we have uh, some magnetic field gradients which allow us to uh, apply some spatial encoding which then allows us to in conjunction with the information from the radio frequency coil, it allows us to separate out these signals. And so at the end of all this, um, you'll see in this case, um, tip as, as you normally get in these studies, you get uh, one, of the, one of the images um, is in the center of the field of view and then one of, the, one of them is aliased. So in this case, we have a T2, the T2 data is in the center and we have an alias T2 star image. And then uh, by applying the SMS methods, uh, we can then separate out these different contrasts which have been acquired at the same time. And at the end of the day, we have then a T2 star data set and we have um, a diffusion weighted data set uh, which has been acquired in the same time as just acquiring the diffusion data. Um, another area um, uh, which I mentioned introduced at the beginning, of course, is compressed sensing. So this is uh, certainly having a big impact uh, in uh, MRI right now. And so the, the basic idea, of course, is to replace our, our normal acquisition with um, a, a random undersampled acquisition. So looking at the top, we have a fully sampled data set where we have the raw case-based data, which is related to the image, image space by a, a simple Fourier transform relationship. And then uh, to, when we perform these compressed sensing acquisitions, uh, we acquire a smaller number of data points which have been randomly sampled uh, out of the original uh, required data set. And then if we, if we apply the Fourier transform, you can see the effect on that. It essentially looks like a noisy image. Um, and what we can then do is we can use uh, some properties of uh, sparsity to transform this, these data into a sparse uh, data set. Um, so this is really exploiting some of the methodology that comes from uh, the, the JPEG compression and so forth. And then, then this then becomes an iterative uh, reconstruction task. So how does this work? Um, we can use the wavelet, wavelet transform to produce um, this sparse representation of the image data. And so here's an example of uh, the fully sampled data set. And then uh, if we transform into this wavelet domain, uh, you'll immediately see that the, that the relevant signal is now uh, confined to a smaller number of uh, pixels. Uh, similarly, with the undersampled data set, so this is undersampling just in, the, in this direction. So this will be the phase encoding direction. Uh, we can do the same trick and uh, you can see the effect of uh, that uh, wavelet transformation. Sorry for the equation, but uh, the, the only key feature of this slide is that the, this, this equation has got three components. Um, and just to give you an idea of um, the, th the, the three different uh, considerations when these optimization procedures are being performed. Uh, so firstly, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the the iterative reconstruction uh, that we perform is consistent with the, de the measured data. So there's, there's some kind of guess uh, as to the image. Um, then, then we translate that into the subsampled data, and then we can compare that with the original. Um, we then this second term makes sure that the data that we acquire um, is in some way has a sparse representation in this wavelet dimension. 
and, and this is then uh, part of this optimization. And then finally, we, um, uh, we, ask the, the, we ask the iteration to provide us with solutions which give us a, a smooth image. Um, and all of this together, which is, for most of us is usually just a black box that we, that we then apply, um, there's some quite interesting results. So this is, um, this is seven Tesla image, uh, an MRA scan, magnetic resonance angiography. Uh, one of these images was acquired uh, in four minutes, uh, one of them in 12 minutes. Um, I, I know it's probably not the, the ideal area, the ideal situation to make the comparison, but uh, even if you have a, a close look at these images, they look pretty similar. Um, and uh, the standard image is on the left, and the compressed sensing acquisition, which is now a third of the original, is on the right. So these, these set techniques are very powerful. They depend on the exact data types. Obviously, this kind of data is quite sparse in the first place, because we have just signal in the vessels. So this is particularly appropriate for this kind of study. And another example here, uh, this is a spectroscopic example, where we're separate, separating out fat and water signal. And so the top, the top image here is a, a water image, and at the bottom we have a fat image. Uh, this is a scan time of five minutes. Um, applying, because in this case we have more dimensions, we can be, uh, we can, um, be more extreme with the, some of the parameters that we apply. And so it's possible to, to uh, reduce this data set to a 50-second scan time, for example. And if we look at the, the spectra, so um, the optic nerve, of, uh, which has predominantly a water signal, and then the orbital fat signal. Um, the, the blue and the red um, are showing us uh, the difference between the, the, those two reconstructions, or the red is the difference, should I say. Um, you can see here um, there's very little uh, difference between these two reconstructions uh, in the spectroscopic content. Uh, so this, this is ongo ongoing work, and um, we're hoping to be able to apply this to uh, met metabolite uh, imaging in the brain, and hopefully this will allow us to increase the resolution, uh, spatial resolution of some of these metabolite uh, imaging studies. Um, next topic I want to have a look at is um, real-time motion correction. Uh, so, as anyone working in, uh, with clinical imaging knows, um, you know you spend a lot of time uh, optimizing your methodology, and then uh, when you go to the clinical case, uh, it's quite disappointing that you never quite see the uh, quality that you are expecting. Subject motion um, is obviously the reason for this, and uh, there's many subject, many patient groups that, um, however hard they try. Uh, I find it difficult to, to be really cooperative in this case. Currently, there aren't any really good methods for correcting the kind of standard 2D sequences that we usually use for T2-weighted imaging and so forth. Um, so th this, uh, this work is trying to um, apply uh, some methodology to allowing us to do exactly that kind of correction. And the, the method that uh, is being used here is um, simply at the very beginning of the scan, there's a volume measurement. And then during the scan, uh, there's some additional images which are required, um, but only three images are required um, at each time point, and then these three images are then registered to the original volume data set. Uh, so the nice thing about this is that it gives us a very high temporal resolution, and it allows us then to apply an update to the scanner. So essentially, we're then moving our slices around, moving our field of view around in real time to hopefully track the motion of the head. Um, and we can do this uh, with, a scan, with, a, with a, a time of something like 300 milliseconds. So this can be done in a very, very quickly without any additional hardware, just relying upon the images themselves. And there's these nice results here. Uh, so the red, the red curve is showing um, some motion from a, a trained subject who was uh, performing a particular protocol. Uh, and the red, uh, so the red is the residual um, motion parameters uh, without applying the correction, and then blue uh, with the correction applied. And so we're able to make a really quite a substantial correction for some of this effect that we see. Um, and this slide just shows uh, the final result of that. So the slide, uh, the column on the left is showing um, the, the data that we get if, if we don't have any subject motion. Um, in the middle, um, if we apply this, uh, this standardized motion protocol. Uh, we have images which are essentially undiagnostic uh, artifacts and, and blurring. Um, then if we apply our correction methods to exactly the same kind of uh, motion protocol, um, it's not quite uh, equivalent to the original, but it's certainly very close to the original with much reduced um, artifact. And so we then have really diagnostic images again, even though the subject in this case was moving uh, many centimeters uh, during the scan. Uh, a nice opportunity is to combine this with the simultaneous multi-slice option that I, I explained at the very beginning. So in this case, uh, we similarly start with uh, some kind of reference volume. And then uh, when we acquire our three slices, we can do this now in a single shot. So we can just acquire um, 
one excitation, which gives us data from all three slices. And then these three slices are instantly applied by, uh, instantly used to provide um, some uh, image registration. And then within 120 milliseconds now, we can provide an update. Um, and this is actually, um, would be a lot quicker with just slightly uh, faster computing hardware. So you can see now that uh, this methodology, just based upon images, can produce really quite nice, uh, robust uh, results. And this is then the data, um, the, the same method um, showing you the, the outcome of the fMRI um, experiment. Um, and just to point out, uh, so these curves are a bit messy, but um, if you can, you can possibly see a little black curve in the middle. So the black curve is the, um, these residual motion uh, components that we have if we apply the correction technique. Um, if we don't do anything, we get these red lines. And even if you apply the volume-based methods, which are typical, um, which is the the um, which is uh, the, bl the sorry the red one is the volume-based method. The green one is uh, no correction. So the volume-based method, which is the standard, doesn't do the job very well. Uh, but these uh, these slice to volume methods with the high temporal resolution, uh, they they provide this high level of correction, which is is quite nice. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the quantitative uh, effects. So that's looking, quali so looking qualitatively at these images. You can see um, without correction on the left, uh, sorry, without correction on the left and with the correction on the right, you can see hopefully um, increased uh, blurring, for example, in this slice here. But the, the rather interesting thing is to see what happens if we look at quantitative data. So this is um, uh, nicely in response to uh, some referees. So uh, it was a, a nice experiment to be coerced into. Uh, so here's uh, the mean diffusivity in three subjects. And uh, so the red is if we don't, the distribution of the mean diffusivity across the brain if we don't apply the correction, and on the right if we apply the correction. And you can see when the correction is applied, you get a much more uh, uniform distribution um, of, of these, these values. And then actually quite interestingly, um, if we move uh, to this figure, um, here we have uh, actually four different curves. So we have... Um, one experiment with head restraint and one experiment without head restraint. And then in both cases, we have um, a data set with correction and a, a data set without correction. And the rather interesting thing is um, if we apply um, the motion correction, so the blue one with head, re head restraint and the dotted one actually with no head restraint with motion correction, uh, you'll see that this, uh, this distribution is really, cleverly, uh, really nicely aligned. So the blue dotted and the blue lines uh, whether or not we bother to secure our subject, we've got the same behavior of our quantitative data, which is nice and reassuring. Um, and then in the cases where we don't use head restraint, we get this dotted red line and don't do correction. Um, even if we have head restraint um, and we don't apply correction, we still get a really an inferior uh, result. Uh, so, so this is a nice validation, I, th I think, of, of this methodology. Um, my final couple of slides, um, I just want to mention the topic of 7-Tesla, which is, is my current uh, focus. Uh, so obviously, 7-Tesla really gives us access to these really, really nice high-resolution images. Um, the multi the um, MRA image at the top, so this has a, a 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. Um, and you can see here these uh, sub-millimeter uh, vessels coming off the middle cerebral artery. Um, obviously, this high resolution um, is going to need some very severe motion correction to allow us to uh, really exploit the, this extreme uh, level of uh, detail. Um, and then this is a SWI, so this is um, uh, this is a, a filtered, essentially a filtered T2 star weighted image where we're extracting out um, signal which has been affected by the deoxyhemoglobin in the in the veins. Um, and this is very this is a nice example uh, from a healthy subject. Um, but it's very sensitive to hemorrhage. So this is a nice clinical tool. It will, allow, it will allow us to look at micro bleeds and so forth in a patient population. And uh, it's interesting also to note at this point, once we start to get to this level of detail, um, there's, we're really blurring the boundaries between um, abnormal and so-called normal subjects. So you'll see these little clusters of uh, venous uh, formations. Uh, this is actually one of our neurologists. Um, so this becomes like quite. This then becomes quite interesting to uh, investigate uh, what's happening in the in, in the normal population in these cases, and then just moving over to routine T2 weighted imaging. Uh, this this can also be then extended to very high resolution. So this image is um, something like a 0.4 millimeter um, in plane resolution. Uh, however, um, so my final slide, um, I, I introduce a little bit of uh, a Scottish. Uh, content, uh, which is appropriate, obviously, uh, to, to this, uh, this lecture series. Um, 
we still have some challenges at ultra high fields. So at seven tesla, we, we move into a domain where the wavelengths, we're at 300 megahertz at seven tesla. We move into a domain where the wavelengths within, within the body are uh, comparable to anatomical dimensions. And so we have these, uh, these variations of signal. So you can see on this top scan here, some signal loss in this coronal image. Um, and the, 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 way to, uh, the way to address this type of abnormality in the images is to um, have a multiple transmit coil. So this is now a coil which is sending, uh, in, sending uh, signals into the subject from multiple channels, so multiple elements um, with their own local spatial variation. Uh, and this is some work um, from a colleague who's developing these coils in, in Glasgow. Um, the, 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 the scanner we're using uh, is equipped with eight parallel transmit channels, and so this is, this is the functionality that we're going to be exploiting. Um, and if you, if you apply these corrections, you can see um, on the image uh, on the bottom how you're able to remove uh, some of this variation. Um, so this requires, obviously, um, great hardware expertise and radio frequency coil engineering knowledge, which is, is in itself a, a black art it seems, uh, plus uh, a lot of physics input. So there's, there's, there's a, a strong requirement here to perform uh, lots of simulations using Maxwell's equations to try to understand uh, what's happening with these field distributions in the brain and also to validate the coil. So before we can use these coils in vivo, we need to make sure that the coil is behaving um, in a way that's consistent with these simulations. So, th so this is a, a nice application of, uh, of physics uh, in, in the field of MRI. Um, that's my final slide. Um, I would like to thank uh, many collaborators and colleagues, uh, past and present, uh, who have helped me with the work that I've presented and uh, am preparing for this presentation. Uh, so thank you very much indeed.